And I am with that really excited to turn things over to Kurt Mead, who is an interpretive naturalist at Tetagooch State Park and the founder of the Minnesota Dragonflies Society. Um, a longtime North House instructor. It doesn't fit into the schedule for him very much these days, but has taught all kinds of different classes at North House. I was lucky enough to take one of them. And uh, I think it may have been the one and only dragonfly class where we didn't actually find any dragonflies, but it was not the instructor's fault. It was pouring rain and 48 degrees. So even in July, uh, but I still learned a lot and was so glad that Kurt uh, was willing to join us this evening. He is the author of the award-winning and, uh, and not only the best, but I think the only uh, guidebook to dragonflies of the North Woods. Uh, so we look forward to hearing more about your work, Kurt. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm going to, I'm going to PowerPoint presentation I'm going to be doing that is um, not super long, and it's going to cover the basic life history of dragonflies and damselflies. Uh, they're closely related. We'll talk about that a little bit. But there's so much more to talk about with dragonflies. I could go on for hours. So what I'm hoping is that um, as we get going, um, Jess is going to curate some questions for me, and she can just interrupt at any time. Or I don't know how you're going to do that, but but feel free. And uh, um, and then when I get to the end of the kind of the life history, natural history portion of it, um, then we can we can talk about some other um, aspects of dragonflies and damselflies and hear your questions and hopefully come up with some answers. I'm gonna share my screen right now. Oh. Jessica, is that looking okay? It looks great. I think you're all set. All right. So dragonflies and damselflies together are in the group called the Odonata. Odonata means the toothed ones, the ones with teeth. They are predators. Um, so they need, they need big um, choppers to chop, chop their food up. There's all, there's all sorts of um, other common names, colloquial names for them. The mosquito hawks, devil's darning needles, snake doctors. Um, Devil's Riding Horse around the world. There's all sorts of interesting, interesting names for them. It, it's interesting that the the more European centric, Eurocentric names oftentimes have a negative connotation to them, whereas um, in in Asian countries they're more revered and more highly respected. Um, but somehow, somewhere along the way, um, we got the idea that. Dragonflies were were an agent of the devil or something like that. The word the words the name dragonfly come from, and the only only theory I can come up with is that people heard stories and saw tapestries and and pictures of dragons and damsels in distress, and uh, they never actually saw any dragons, and they concluded that dragons had just shrunk down to a smaller size. Um, and become dragonflies. And then the damselfly is, it's a bit, a bit more uh, delicate creature, um, more of a maiden, more of a damsel, I guess, in a, in a, in a sense like that. The difference between dragonflies and damselflies um, can be summed up pretty quickly. The, the wings are of different size and shape. So if you look at this Halloween pennant, um, which does live here in the North Woods. Um, the fore wings, the front wings closer to the head, are more slender than the hind wings, which are very, um, have a lot more surface area to them. The eyes are in contact at the top of the head most of the time. We'll get into some uh, one exception. And they have a robust abdomen. Their abdomen is, is thicker and, and stouter than the damselfly. Damselflies are truly needle shaped, uh, very slender, long slender abdomens. And look at those wings. Those wings are folded up over the abdomen and they are, all four wings are of the same size and shape. So they line right up. It's, it's, it, you'd have a hard time counting four wings in there, but there are. 
Um, all insects have four wings. The eyes are widely separated at the top of the head. They have a big space in between. There are some other differences between them, but for our purposes here tonight, we're, that's going to be enough. Um, if you if you see a dragonfly or a damselfly and you know those few facts, you'll know the difference between them. They're a very old order of, of organisms. They've been around for over 300 million years. There are um, fossil records of dragonflies with a 29 inch wingspan. And um, I'm really pleased we don't have dragonflies that big here today because life would be very different with predators of that size flying around. Today, the largest dragonfly is an Australian species that has a wingspan of six inches. So kind of take your hand and make a six inch span with your forefinger and your thumb maybe, or your other fingers and, and see how big that is. That's a pretty, pretty good sized insect. That's a big insect. Not as big as the Carboniferous period, but um, pretty big by modern standards. They are winged predators of the air. They are um, they are meat eaters. Dragonflies, particularly, um, you never say never, never say absolutely, but they are um, feeding almost exclusively on insects that are in flight. Uh, you can kind of fool them by flicking gravel or a little bit of grass or something up in the air. Sometimes they'll come at it just to investigate it to see what it is. They they're very they're very visual creatures. They are all about their vision. Take a look at those eyes. Um, some of our darner species, uh, one of the families that we have here, uh, has over 30,000 lenses per eye. That's per eye. We have one lens per eye. They have 30,000 per eye. So you can see that vision is kind of their superpower. They, they have no sense of hearing that we know of. They have no sense of taste. And they definitely have no sense of humor very serious insects. The upper photo is of a, a chalk-fronted corporal eating a horsefly that was trying to get, get to me. It flew right up on my arm and grabbed it. And that's my sleeve. Um, the green, the big green dragonfly in the, in the corner is eating a damselfly, which hardly seems fair, but that's the way life goes. And then you've got a damselfly eating a moth. Damselflies, um, some, some species in particular are more apt to pick, say, an ant climbing up the stem of a plant, or even some of them specialize in spiders, picking spiders out of webs. Uh, so those are not flying insects. That's kind of another difference is that damselflies, uh, they do eat mostly flying insects, but there are some of them that are, that, that will prey on crawling insects as well. None of them are scavengers, none of them are herbivores. They are all predators. But they are also food for lots of other animals. It's they're very important. Um, uh, an organism I don't have up on this slide here is the purple martin. And if anyone has purple martins around their place, they probably have they probably live on or near a lake or a river. Uh, because the purple martins really do spend most of their time hunting dragonflies. I don't hold that against them. It's what they do. It's it's who they are. And uh, uh, Everyone's got to eat, right? We've got a uh, sundew, a predaceous plant with a damselfly in the upper photo. And then going from left, left to right, um, a robber fly with a meadow hawk. So it's actually a fly, a dipteran species with a, with a dragonfly that's, that it's eating. We have a merlin in the bottom center. Um, a lot of the small falcons, especially the kestrels and merlins, um, do feed on a lot of dragonflies. Uh, I've witnessed it uh, in the wild and it's quite a sight to see. And then we've got dragonflies eating dragonflies. Now in this case, we've got a Midland club tail that's eating a basket tail of some sort. And some people would say that's cannibalism. No, that's not cannibalism because they're different species. Uh, they're both dra dragonflies, but they're different species. We're gonna have the sex talk now, talk about the reproduction. Um, here we have a pair. They were very dedicated to what they were doing because I was able to net them and then hold them in this position. But it really shows the wheel position very well. 
And that is the male um, being held in my thumb, thumb and finger. He has grasped the female by the back of the head. Her abdomen is arched forward and is connected to um, what's known as a secondary genitalia or hamulus um, process underneath his abdomen there. When he's ready to um, find a mate and uh, um, get get that mate to, to to have his eggs have her, her eggs fertilized by him, he'll transfer a sperm packet from the end of his abdomen up into that little space and hold it. It's like a little envelope, a little packet of sperm. And when he catches a female, he actually has to assume that he's not the first one to mate with that female. So he has special tools. There's no pretty way to say it, but he has special tools that will clean out the investment of any other male that's been there before him. So that her eggs are all just um, fertilized by him. And that is a very, very unique dragonfly and damselfly reproductive strategy. There's no other insect order uh, in the world that that does things this way. Uh, but oftentimes you'll see them flying with one of them essentially backwards and the one forward and the one forward who's doing the flying is the male. Here's a close up of that grasping the back of the head. He has specialized structures. It's a three parted clamp that um, is like a lock and key that fits perfectly on the back of her head and he holds her by the back of her head. That's a competitive advantage in reproduction uh, to have, have control of your mate in that way. Uh, dragonflies have a three-parted clamp and one more difference is between the two is damselflies have a four-parted clamp. But again, it works the same way, sort of a lock and key that grabs the back of the head um, in, in order to ensure that he is, he is the father. And we get to egg laying. Here's a pair of common green darners. And if you've seen large dragonflies already this spring, there's a good chance that you've been, you've been seeing the common green darner. And the common green darner is one that migrates up from the, from the Gulf Coast in the springtime, lays its eggs here. They, they develop into adults in the fall. Those adults in the fall fly south back down to the Gulf Coast states and the cycle repeats itself. So they're not returning to the same spawning waters like a salmon or something like that, but they are, they are um, finding suitable habitat where there are mates available. And in this case, the common green darner is actually, she's got a little stylus or an ovipositor that's sharp enough to pierce the stems of plants. And um, the eggs are in, nestled into that little hole in the plant stem um, for some time while it develops. And then when it hatches out, the young crawls out of the, out of that hole in the stem and, uh, and the cycle starts over again. Here's a picture under a microscope of meadowhawk eggs. Meadowhawks are kind of the red and yellow, smaller dragonflies that we see late summer, um, just thick with them all over the place. Some dragonfly eggs are long and skinny like sausages, and some are round, some are oval, different sizes, shapes, and they have different structures on their eggshells that uh, uh, people who know such things can actually identify a dragonfly species by the structure and the shape of its eggshell. Not me though. Once the egg hatches, it becomes a nymph. Some people call it a larva. Some people, the older, old school, call it a naiad. Um, there's still hot debate in the dragonfly world as to whether it's a nymph or a larva. Um, for our purposes here, I'll probably just use the word nymph. Um, and the inset photo is a sort of a selection of different. Um, there's some damselfly. There's a damselfly nymph in there, a long, skinny one, and then there's a collection of different dragonfly nymphs in there. The, if you look at the large photo of the nymph, the very tip of the abdomen, there's little structures back there, and that's called the anal pyramid. And it's a little structure that closes up or opens up as need be. Why would you need to open your anus? 
for the obvious reasons, but you, if you're a dragonfly nymph, you also have gills inside your abdomen, and that is how you breathe. You suck water up, up through that anal pyramid to the gills uh, inside your abdomen, extract the oxygen from it, and exhale out again. And they can use this defensively if they're trying to get away from something. They don't swim very fast. They, they're crawlers, and they don't swim fast like a minnow or like a little fish. They, they're, they're slower than that, but they can become jet propelled by squirting that water uh, strongly out of its abdomen. There's a fun fact that I hope you didn't know before tonight that you know now. After some time passes, and some time could be um, three to four weeks for some species, some time could be three months, like for the common green darner, um, or for uh, this nymph that we see on the right hand side with a little white thread sticking out of it, that's a dragon hunter. That one we think may go as long as seven years underwater up here before it becomes an adult. So they're an adult for four to six weeks, which for an insect is not a, not, not a bad lifespan. That's a pretty good lifespan for a bug, but, but they could be as much as seven years old before they take their first flight. You can see in the other photo, the wings, this is a dragonfly, but the wings when they first emerge are folded up over their back, just like a damselfly. Um, they use hemolymph for blood to, to pump their abdomen and their wings out. They come out pretty compact. I mean, if you look at the exuvia or that shed skin that it's hanging off of, all that dragonfly used to fit inside that shell. And I've watched it happen and it still boggles my mind that that, that came out of that but it does. They inflate with hemolymph or blood, as well as lots of air, they have air sacs and air pockets inside. Um, and the veins and the wings are actually veins. There are actually tubes that carry the hemolymph for the blood um, out to inflate those wings larger uh, until they're of full size. The whole sort of emergence to first flight phase lasts approximately an hour. Imagine how vulnerable they are right then. This dragonfly cannot yet fly. It's, it's, it's still got too much hemolymph. But before they fly, they actually drop out a whole bunch of their blood. They actually drip it out of their tip of their abdomen because um, they, they need the hydraulic pressure to push the abdomen out and the wings out. But they also need to lose some weight so that they can make that first weak flight that they make early on in their lives. This one, this one's probably still got a half hour to go before it, before it flies. And why should we look at dragonflies in Minnesota? And I know we got people from all over North America here tonight, which is fun. And, and hopefully this will spur some thoughts about where you live as well. But Minnesota is sort of a biological hotspot. We have four distinct different biomes. Biomes are ecoregions. They are uh, um, places with similar climate and vegetation and soils and characteristics that make them similar, um, the four different biomes in the state. But we're also in a neat spot on the continent where north meets south and east meets west. We have, we have species that are pretty common in our state that are also common down in Mexico. We also have some species that we can find in Minnesota that are common up in the Arctic. And these ranges overlap right here. We're in, we're in a neat spot. There are other states with more species than we've got, but a lot of people, there's actual dragonfly tourism that goes on. There's people that come to our state just because of the, of the wide variety of different things that you might be able to find here. Some examples of that, if we look in the Northeastern Corner, we'll start there because that's that's where I'm at right now. That's where North House is. Um, we have found an insect called the Quebec Emerald, a dragonfly called the Quebec Emerald, which up until the time we found it just outside of Finland, Minnesota here, hadn't been found anywhere. It's been found in 10 spots in Maine, nowhere else in the United States. Um, but then 
in pockets in British Columbia and then on the Atlantic seaboard on the opposite coast of Canada. And it's thousands of miles to the nearest population. And since we found them, we know what kind of habitat they need. They know what kind of waters they're going to live in, they're going to breed in. And if we go to those areas, which are um, patterned peatlands, they're kind of rare um, fens, um, bog like fens in, in our state. Uh, if we find a patterned peatland, visit it, there's a good chance we'll find a Quebec emerald. So they're very, very specific to the habitat. But these patterned peatlands are not places people go to recreate or or enjoy themselves. They're, they're mosquito filled um, wetlands that are soggy and sloppy and, and wet, which is my favorite kind of wetland. And people just don't get out and look at them very often. But on the southeastern corner of the state, the Royal River Cruiser is um, a large dragonfly that uh, inhabits large rivers. So the Mississippi River is, is the breeding area for it. It doesn't breed outside of large rivers like that. And it, uh, it was found in Wisconsin, um, right on the Mississippi River. And the gentleman who found it um, quickly got in his car and drove across the bridge and found it again in Minnesota so he could find it in two states just that easily that quickly. So it's fairly rare. Um, the Plains Emerald is uh, an, another emerald species that needs high quality um, streams in what is now agricultural land. And, and agricultural land and high quality streams don't often go hand in hand. Um, so it's, it's kind of a tough one to find sometimes, but if you do find it uh, in the particular stream, if you find a good high quality stream, you can find quite a few of them. The spring water dancer is a damsel fly that had never been found in the state before. And during a workshop that I conducted down at Blue Mound State Park, uh, we found spring water dancers. They get all the way down into Mexico. And this is the, there's one spot in, in the Dakotas where it's farther north than Rock County in Minnesota. Uh, but it's, otherwise it's the second farthest north um, location for that species in the world. And then the red-veined meadowhawk is truly a, a, a prairie species. Once you get out in the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, you'll find red-veined meadowhawks and they just sneak into the northeastern corner of, northwestern corner of our state and are uh, uh, charismatic little red species. I alluded to habitats a little bit. We're gonna just talk about this. Um, if you think about other animals, say, say birds or mammals, if you want to find a moose, you need to go to the right habitat to find it. If you want to find a bobolink, you need to go to the right habitat in order to find it. And that's the same with dragonflies and damselflies. They don't just live in any old water. There are some species that seem to um, be able to handle most conditions and, and are pretty widespread and are pretty common. Um, in all these habitats, but it, in general, most of them have very specific habitat needs. Um, and I'm gonna break those down into rivers, lakes and ponds, and bogs. In rivers, we have a lot of the club tails. I'm gonna talk about club tails here in just a minute, but they're kind of the trout of the, of the dragonfly world. They're, um, most of them are very uh, water quality sensitive. And, uh, won't breed if there's a lot of sedimentation or the water gets too warm or the oxygen levels drop too low. So very much like trout. And in this case, I've highlighted the rusty snake tail, which is pretty common up in these parts. Lakes and ponds um, are really dominated by uh, another family of dragonflies called the skimmers. And the skimmers are the ones that we see most often. There's, there's more of them than other family members, the other families that we've got. A lot of them are, are very pretty. They're, they have a lot of markings on the wings. This one's called the four spotted skimmer, uh, which um, just as a side note, also occurs in Europe. They have the same species in Europe. I've seen them in France and I've seen them in Sweden um, and I've seen them here at home as well. But th these rich, these, these rich nutrient-filled habitats like this um, are, are 
good home for a lot of these skimmers. And you've got bogs, this crimson ringed white face with it, just that intense red and black on it. You will not find a crimson ring, ringed white face um, too far away from a bog. They don't fly very far. They stick close to home and uh, you got to go to bogs to find them. And that's, that's true for a number of our um, kind of important species in the state. We're going to do a real simple little walk through of the six different families of dragonflies that we have in Minnesota. I like to break things down into smaller parts. You know, you put too much in your mouth and you'll choke on it. You put too much in your brain and you fry. You just, you just can't make sense of it all. So um, here are some, some simple little tips that'll get you um, from dragonfly to the next level of identification, which would be the family level. I'll start with the darners, and you can see that the eyes come together. Um, it almost looks like two inflated balloons that have been shoved together to make a flat line, a flat plane right in between here. So there's a long margin. And this is the group here that has as many as 30,000 lenses per eye. Um, but there's no other group of dragonflies out there that has got this characteristic of the eyes just being mashed together at the top of the head. Let's contrast that with the spike tails. And the spike tails, their eyes meet, it's almost like an infinity symbol or they meet at a point. There's, there's a tiny little space between them, but it's, it's inconsequential. And they, they have very sort of from front to back, very narrow eyes, very broad. And um, we only have a few spike tail species that live in Minnesota, so they're not they're not often encountered. But when they are, this is a good way to tell tell who you've got. Move to the club tails. Remember, I told you that the all dragonflies have eyes that are in contact at the top of their head. But here's the exception. This is a dragon hunter, one of our largest dragonflies, and. Um, She's got a, a space between the eyes, a measurable space. Everything else about her screams dragonfly. She's got the wings that, that, that stick out like an airplane. The four wings are of different sizes and shapes. She's got a three-parted, or the male will have a three-parted clamp on top of her head. The dragon hunter is, is pretty famed for its robustness, for its size, for its um, just being tough. To show you how tough they are, this is, I know this is a female because these little spots on her eyes, if you can follow my cursor, are scars left behind from the male grabbing her from the back of the head during mating. That's how strong the males are. They actually damage the eyes. Um, she's obviously doing fine and, and was laying more eggs. But club tails have a space between their eyes. Dropping to the bottom left to the cruiser family. The cruiser family, there's a lot of different um, species of dragonflies that have stripes on the thorax. And the thorax is the body part where the wings and the legs um, attach. It's kind of a muscle box. There's other stuff going on in there, but it's really full of muscles for wings and for the legs. And the cruiser has got one sort of creamy yellow, almost white stripe um, down its side. Any other species with stripes on the thorax are going to have two or more stripes. So if you've got one bold stripe on the thorax, that's going to be cruiser. And we only have a couple of species of those. It's a small family in our state as well. But they're early, so we should be seeing the uh, stream cruiser and the swift river cruiser here soon. The emerald family, um, it's not, as you can see from the other pictures, it's not the only family with green eyes, but there's something different about the green in the eyes of an emerald. They, they look like they're lit up from the inside, um, like a Christmas tree light or something like that. But they also have, if you look at the second arrow there, they also have a thin yellow to white band between these abdominal segments right here. Um, if you look, this one doesn't have it. The cruisers don't have it. 
the emeralds have got this little band right here. It wasn't that long ago that they were considered part of the skimmer family, but they've been broken out because there are some differences in them. And the, finally, the skimmer family, like I mentioned, they're, they're some of the very uh, uh, brightly colored ones that we have, lots of markings on wings. If you've got a dragonfly with, with heavy markings on the wings, there's a 99% chance that it's going to be a skimmer because there's very few other um, species within these other families that have heavy markings on the wings. So there you go, the six families. Um, there won't be a quiz, but uh, you can go ahead and check them out yourself this summer. What action can you take? Um, get yourself a guidebook. Um, use the online resources like iNaturalist and um, the Minnesota Dragonfly Society has a Facebook page that's very kind and uh, we don't allow any, any bad behavior on that on that site and it's they're very helpful people so there there are people there that want to help you learn and so we get a lot of beginners that are posting pictures of pretty common things that say I don't know what this is and so we teach you what it is and how to tell what it is um, without saying oh that's just a four spotted skimmer so it's a very kind kind of place um, and then uh, the Minnesota Dragonfly Society is a group of people that gets out and about throughout the state. They're most active around the metro, but they do get out and about around the state and uh, do surveys, do research. Uh, I've been involved in research that, that has had me in a helicopter flying into remote bogs looking for Quebec emeralds, uh, but a lot of workshops and things as well. The dragonfly community are kind of a special, special breed. And then there's a kind of a you know, now becoming an international clearinghouse of data called Odonata Central, where you can take your photos and put them up on Odonata Central. And uh, whether you know the identification of them or not, someone will identify them for you. I'm the Minnesota person for that. So I keep an eye on that website and uh, help people identify dragonflies. That is the end of my PowerPoint. I'm going to stop sharing. And I am really anxious to entertain some questions right now. Jessa, what you got for me? All right. We've had a lot of questions come in. Thanks so much, Kurt. Um, let's see. Where should we start? Um, maybe this is following up on your taking action. Um, how do you get a dragonfly out of a net without damaging its wings? They're pretty tough. Um, I would say their wings are tougher than that of a butterfly. I have a harder time handling butterflies. I don't do it very much just because I, I can't I can't do it without causing problems. But um, my my main technique is to is to isolate the dragonfly down into the very tip end of my dragonfly bag, my net bag, reach in there and try and get my fingers up over both sets of wings so that I'm holding it as a model. Hold it just a little higher, yeah. There we go. So I'm holding it something like this. With the wings, wings in my fingers and the body there. And that's that's pretty safe for you and for them. Some of these have pretty strong jaws. Um, they won't just fly up and bite you. There's no advantage for them to bite you. It's not like they're blood sucking or um, need a blood meal or anything like that, but I have been bitten um, many, many times, but I have it coming because I've been harassing these bugs and holding them the wrong way. And there are some that can draw blood, but um, if you handle them carefully, just by the wings like that, they are, um, it's safe for them and safe for you. They have no venom. Good to know. Great. Um, let's see. Our uh, dragonflies and damselflies not bothered by toxins in ants and spiders and other prey? Not that I know of. I would imagine that there might be some bee species that have some defenses, but um, it's actually been found that the dragon hunter, that big dragonfly I was talking about, um, I actually got a, a model of one right here. So that's a pretty big bug. 
I know mm -hmm. there's a glare, but you can see the silhouette. You can see it pretty well, yeah. Okay, that one there is um, fairly immune to um, the toxins and stings and things like that. So it can handle taking big stinging insects and eat them. And even if it gets stung, it seems to be immune to them. Hmm. Deserving of the name then. It is the dragon hunter. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions about sort of dragonfly territory. How much, how big of an area do they patrol? Um, and how do they establish that? Do they have territories? Yeah, the males are very territorial. They will pick out the prime breeding waters and they will protect it. They will try to compete, outcompete other males, mm -hmm. try to drive them away so that when the female does wander in, the females tend to spend less time near water because if they're near water, they're going to get mobbed by the males, grabbed by the back of the head and hauled off. So they tend to spend more time in the woodlands, in open fields, uh, along roadways, away from the water until they're ready to, to breed, until they have eggs. And they'll, they'll lay eggs multiple times throughout their life cycle, throughout their lifespan. Um, like throughout the seven weeks you were referring to? Yeah, yeah, throughout okay. that four yeah. to six weeks, they'll, they'll lay eggs multiple times. Um, but they don't always have a batch of eggs mature and ready to go. So they stay away from the water until they're ready. And then they come to the right kind of water that they need, that their young are going to need to lay their eggs. They get grabbed by a male. That whole mating thing happens. They lay their eggs. But the males are guarding those territories. And there are some, some species, it depends on the species. On some species, the the entire range of this dragonfly that, that is protecting is one square meter in size. Mm -hmm. um, other ones, like some of our darner species, these big kind of blue ones, um, they'll patrol um, hundreds of yards of shoreline, just back and forth, just going back and forth and chasing out any interlopers that happen along. Uh, so it depends on the species as to how much territory. Sometimes it's kind of a linear territory, like the edge of a, a lake shore. Um, sometimes it's it's more three dimensional um, in a bog or something like that. Hey, that's so interesting. Um, let's see. Oh, Lutzen neighbor Kim Corliss asks, "Why do we see the dragonflies about a week after the black midges come out? Do they hang out and follow the midges north? How does that work?" And I agree. There's always a sense of relief when the dragonflies show up. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, that June flush of dragonflies that we see, um, there are probably probably in during the month of June. There's probably more dragonflies on the wing than any other month. That doesn't mean more species or more diversity, but just simply more dragonflies on the wing um, than at any other given time in the summer. And that makes sense because look what's out there. We got the black flies, we got the mosquitoes, we got lots of other insects and midges, um, lots of food. Um, for them, so it would make sense to have this big eruption of, of numbers during those times when there's lots of food available. And that's true everywhere, not just in, we notice it a lot here on the North Shore, but. Yeah, it's, it's pretty noticeable here on the North Shore. I guess I, I'm not sure on other habitats, you know, more mm -hmm. desert habitats or drier habitats or more tropical habitats, what happens with those. But the seasonality of our dragonflies here is 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 pretty remarkable. Um, we could just get that huge flush of individuals right um, right as all those other bugs are coming out. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, lots of questions about migration. Do all species migrate? Uh, what? Why do they migrate? Um, and how do they do it in four to six weeks? Well, they migrate because it gets cold. There's only there's only, it depends on how you count it, four or five species that do migrate. The poster child of those is the common green darner, which I highlighted earlier. And we'll talk about the common green darner. They, they migrate, they, um, you may not think about it, but dragonflies are, they're really fatty insects. They have a lot of fat or oil reserves in their bodies when they're healthy. Um, because you know how, what the weather gets like here, like Jessa, that workshop that we attempted to do when it was 45. There's a lot of variation possible. 
45 degrees and raining for three or four days, they got to survive that somehow. They got to have the reserves to survive that somehow. And the green darner um, puts on a huge amount of those fats, those oils um, inside their body as the fall is progressing. And then as the weather conditions and wind conditions get just right, they start to fly south. Mm -hmm. And they fly south in such numbers that at Hawk Ridge in Duluth, they, they've, they've been able to um, track the American kestrel. The kestrels travel with the common green donors. It's like driving down the I-35 and you're feeling a little snack, snacky. So you roll down your window and you reach out and you grab a uh, hamburger and you just eat that or a donut or something like that. And that's kind of what the kestrels are doing. They time their migration with their food source. Sure. Long down. These dragonflies then get down to the warmer climates um, where they don't have winter in the way that we do. Mm -hmm. They lay their eggs, the larva hatch, eggs hatch into larva, the larva become adults by the following spring. Things start warming up down there in the springtime and they're, then they start flying back north again. So they're, they have an exceptionally long adult lifespan. Instead of four to six weeks, the, the adults live for more like three months. Wow. That's contrasted with the, the larval lifespan is extremely short at only about three months as well. Sure, interesting. Um, but that's a very simple answer to a more complicated question in that, um, starting in early June, we'll start seeing common green darners emerging out of our waters. Um, they overwintered as a mature larva. Mm -hmm. And they overwinter, overwinter and then emerge in the spring. And then, and then uh, we're not sure exactly um, what happens with them. If, they, if they're young, develop fast enough to migrate in the fall or not. They're the same species. There's no genetic difference whatsoever. So it just has to do with timing, apparently. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, this is sort of a silly question, I think, but like, how is that just studied through observation or replacing like tiny tracking devices on green darters? It's the latter. They have actually glued uh, little <laughs> radio transmitters onto the thoraxes of dragonflies and then had chase cars following each insect. They did this on the East Coast and they did about 16 of them and three of the devices failed. So they were able to follow 13 of them until the batteries died on them. But they were heading from New Jersey down coast through Cape May and they found that they didn't like to fly over big vast open water. So they, 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 they follow the shoreline around. It's the same with Lake Superior, you won't, you won't have great migrations over Lake Superior because the water body is just too big. So they follow the shoreline down and that's why Hawk Ridge gets such a concentration of them is because they're getting funneled just like the birds do. Sure, that makes but sense. Yes, they have glued tracking devices on them. Wow, <laughs> that sounds, dragonfly uh, scientists are a special breed. <laughs> we, we, yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. Oh, there's so many good questions coming in. Um, let's see. Lots of questions about um, when to observe recommendations for observing dragonflies. It, should you be what kind of conditions are ideal? They like warm, sunny days. They really like sunshine. There's a few species that'll fly more and at, at dusk or overcast conditions or shaded, heavy, deep woods. But most of them are sun loving. They're um, they're 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 cold-blooded, insects are cold-blooded, but when they're really, really active, the body temperature of a dragonfly will, will actually increase above the ambient air temperature because of the muscle movement mm -hmm. and because of the solar gain and that kind of stuff. And that helps speed up their metabolism and helps make them more efficient. Um, so they're mostly sun loving. Um, windy conditions can be kind of tough for going out to fire them. So if you, can get, if you can get a nice, calm, warm day um, with a lot of sunshine, that's going to be an ideal dragonfly day. Okay. And not and too early in the morning. Birders have to get up at four in the morning 
dragonfly people get to have an extra cup of coffee and wait a little while and until it warms up and then we get to go out at nine or ten o'clock in the morning much more civilized i just can't do the birding thing <laughs> Uh, let's see what kind of, what are some of the most common um, species you might see on the North Shore? Common green donor, of course. Um, some of the more charismatic ones would be 12. Uh, some of these names are great. The 12 spotted skimmer, the, we have a pretty rare one that shows up in bogs that they may already be out. They're very, very early. They're called the ebony bog haunter. They're a little tiny thing. They're just about an inch long. The ebony bog haunter. Um, Stygian shadow dragon uh, can be found along waterfalls. Uh, we have fawn darners and oscillated darners. Um, Lake County alone, Cook County doesn't have, um, Cook County is unique. It's got, it's more monotypical in its habitat. Lake County has got a bit more variety. And then St. Louis County has got a lot of variety. Those are the three arrowhead counties. Mm -hmm. um, and Lake County right now is at over a hundred species of dragonflies and damselflies. We have over a hundred different kinds here. Just in Lake County. That's Just in Lake County. That, that includes both dragonflies and damselflies. That's a lot. Of, That's a of lot. Species, considering there's what, like eight tree species or something. <laughs> All right. Oh my goodness. Let's see. What else should we talk about? I guess the flip side to that are what are some, what's the most unique or rare dragonfly? You high, highlighted a couple of rarities, um, but is there anything you're still looking for that hasn't been found yet? I, there is, I have a, I have sort of a mental list of species that I'm assuming are in the state that haven't been found yet. There's some Arctic species that there's no reason why we haven't found them in Minnesota yet, because some of their close relatives are here, uh, like the Hudsonian, uh, emerald uh, would be one rare one. Um, the Quebec emerald um, is kind of the poster child for um, rare species uh, in the state. They're so, they have such narrow habitat needs that they can only breed in certain waters and you won't find them other places. Um, that's been, that's been one of my most exciting finds is adding that to the state list. Um, let's see. Oh, we of course come to this. Um, threats to dragonfly populations, pesticides, climate change. What, what do we, what do we need to know? Yeah, the work that I was fortunate to do starting in the mid 2000s through the early 2000 teens was to survey the state and try to figure out what dragonflies were living where. And I wish as fun as that was, and it was an amazing experience, and, I, and I, it's one of the highlights of, of my life, but I kind of wish somebody had been around 50 years ago to do the same thing, because how do we know if things are changing, if climate change is affecting the ranges of things? So now it's kind of a waiting game to see. We've got a whole bunch of data, and now a waiting game to see um, is the spring water dancer, that one that was done in Blue Mound State Park, is that one going to be moving itself north? Uh, are things going to be moving east and west? Are things going to be moving north and south? We're not sure about that yet. I don't have a lot of evidence that a lot of that's happening yet, but that may just be a function of the fact that we don't have a lot of evidence. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I do know that um, some of the, the mosquito spraying, the spray, mosquito guard spraying services and things like that, um, I've had people tell me that after they've had that done, that they've found dead dragonflies all over the place. Um, other pesticides, herbicides, um, agricultural areas, that would be a, a bigger area, but up here in the North, people just don't use a lot of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see, maybe a couple more here before we wrap up. Um... Ooh, what can you tell us about dragonfly brains that are processing all these images coming in? They got tiny little brains, <laughs> but they have brains that, when we think of a brain, we think of this, just this brain. And then we've got the spinal column that goes down, the nerves that go up from that. 
a lot of other groups of animals like insects and even reptiles, their, their brains are more diffused throughout their body. They have these ganglia throughout their body. And so um, a dragonfly head is the size it is really to contain the mouth parts, the chewing mouth parts, and to contain the eyes. And there's some brain in there, but a lot of their brain is also then sort of distributed throughout their bodies. Hmm. There are There is a team of people, I think they're at Cornell University that use these little micro probes and can, can hone in on one little nerve going through the neck and, and see how their muscles respond to tracking a fake insect on a computer screen, that kind of thing. So there's, there's some amazing things being done, but it's all very small. Sure. Uh, let's see. One of our audience members um, was a, went to grad school with Scott King, who was photo, a photo credit, and she just wanted to acknowledge how much he did to advance the knowledge of dragonflies and damselflies in Minnesota. Yep. Did you work with him? Yep. We, he was a good friend of mine. Uh, he actually passed away about a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, was in the middle of lots of projects and we're hoping that somehow Minnesota Dragonfly Society can, can do something with some of those projects and keep them alive. Yeah, it's- if that comes to news as you, I'm sorry. Um, wow, lots of great questions that we could answer. Oh, when is the next Minnesota Dragonfly Society event? Um, there are going to be several events. We've got a, a, a monthly board meeting coming up where we're going to determine some of these things next week. But the Minnesota Dragonfly Society webpage, which is mndragonfly.org, easily easy to Google it, um, it has a calendar, calendar of events. And so um, this talk I'm giving tonight, they actually put it up on the calendar of events up there. Um, looks like Leah Darce just put it in the comment, the, the comment page, there's a link to the events um, calendar that they have. And uh, obviously last summer, not much went on. And this summer, there's been discussion as to how much we're going to do, how we're going to do it, what kind of format, just like everyone, we're trying to figure it out. Um, but we're hoping to have multiple events around the state to kind of do a statewide, not really a bio blitz, but um, opportunities for people to go to different parts of the state and, and find things and then have one final sort of webinar or Zoom meeting or something like that where we compile all of our results and just see, just share stories and see what we found. But sometimes on the on the Minnesota Dragonfly Society Facebook site, someone will say, hey, I'm going out uh, in Wright County next weekend and wondering if anyone wants to come along. And that's the kind of community it is. Yeah, there have been a couple of comments in the chat and then the Q&A about what a welcoming and supportive group that Facebook uh, group has been, which is nice to hear. That kind of citizen science is so important. Um, to just yeah do the surveys and find out what's out there. Yeah, I mean um, there are there are uh, if you're a birder, you get really excited about a new county record. Um, if you get a new state record, I mean that's 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 a big hairy deal. But with dragonflies, county records, uh, well, there are some resources out there that can show you the numbers of species per county. And so mm -hmm. if, if you were like, I wanna go find a bunch of new county records of something, um, you can go to a county with low numbers. There still are some counties that are single digit or just above numbers of species per county and just scoop up county records, report them to Odenata Central or iNaturalist um, and, uh, and do real science. Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, lots of questions about a guidebook. I have a feeling I know which one you might recommend. Tell us a little bit about where one could purchase that. Um, it's all over the web. Um, I've seen it in gift shops up and down the North Shore. Um, it's available all over the place. Um, I think we have, we're on the fourth and third edition right now, but there's a new printing of it coming out because it sold out again. And I think we're up to just under 20,000 copies of that book have sold. 
Yeah, Dragonflies of the North Woods, of which right. Kurt is the author. Yeah. So I think we often have it in stock at the North or the North House um, School Store too. So you could always Good give us a call and, and ask Cindy Lou if she's got it on hand. All right, I'm gonna ask one last question and then I think we'll wrap up. What's your favorite species? Oh, I hate this question. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know that. I'll come up with no, another one. <laughs> no, 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 it's a good question. It's a good question. It's just because it just depends on my mood and the day and you know, which child do I love the most? No, it's not go there. Um, Who last bit you? <laughs> the Quebec Emerald, I go back to the Quebec Emerald just because it's so rare and created such a sort of a stir throughout Canada and North America when it was found. When, June Tweekram, who lives up up in your parts of the world, she and I were out and we found that one together and uh, and it created quite a stir and it was it was very exciting. Great. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for your time and thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, thanks for coming, everyone. This has been a blast. Yeah, great turnout. So we will um, post this on our website, northhouse.org in the next day or two. So you can rewatch it or share it if you would like. Um, we'll leave it up there for a while. And um, yeah, we hope you can join us next week with Bob Jansen. He's got lots of great stories to tell. Uh, and hopefully we will all soon be able to be back together again in person for this sort of information, but glad we could do this and have folks from all over the place. So Kurt, thanks so much and have a great summer at Tedagooch. It's been my great honor and we're getting we're getting going with programs at state parks here pretty soon. So be watching. Yeah, stop at Tedagooch on your way up the shore uh, and say hi to Kurt. Absolutely. All right. Take care, everybody. Good night. Thanks all.